Hello, World Wide Web. I'm Gregor Shadow, the internet personality with the best hair. Now, I actually was wanting to have a Thanksgiving-themed movie to review for you today, but strangely enough, I did not have any Thanksgiving horror or action or science fiction movies in my collection. That and preparing for the day is actually taking up uh, quite a bit of my time. All right. Just a few more thrusters, and we can christen the Starship Space Turkey. Never mind that, I have a good enough classic film for you today, Horror Express. And that's thanksgiving E. After all, it stars Christopher Lee and Peter Cushing. That's like a big holiday family get-together right there. And they're on a journey on the Trans-Siberian Railway, which is like that ungodly long drive to Grandma's house. And on the journey there happens to be a horrifying beast that is killing people off one by one, and, uh, and... And that's kind of like that weird uncle you have that you never think about for the rest of the year until you see them at Thanksgiving and remember why. Yep. Anyway, let's take a look at Horror Express and... Wait a minute. What is this, like the fourth movie I've reviewed that the main set is a train? We open to... Yeah. Uh, okay, <laughs> that's enough opening credits. Sorry if you actually wanted to see them, but I'd rather not have any of my viewers suffer an epileptic seizure. After the flashing light in the face establishes the all-important fact that there will be a train in this movie, we move on to the opening narration by Christopher Lee as his character, Alexander Saxton, establishing that this is a true and accurate account of the events that occurred on the Trans-Siberian Railway on this fateful night. <laughs> yeah, I always love it when fictional characters try to point out to me that their fiction is indeed factual, within the confines of their fiction. Yeah. Uh, aren't all stories supposed to work like that? Why do you need to point it out? In any case, an expedition into the mountains of China discovers the frozen remains of an ancestral hominid. Therefore, it is packed up and set for shipping back to Britain with Professor Saxton on the Trans-Siberian Railway. Unfortunately for him, as it's the opening scene of this movie, they just so happen to misplace his reservation, and the entire train is sold out. On the plus side, he runs into his colleague and friend, Dr. Wells, played by Peter Cushing. He and Alice Reinhardt, whom plays Miss Jones, just so happen to be taking the Trans-Siberian Railway back to Britain as well. Miss Jones has been assisting me. Bacteriology, excellent technician. <laughs> For a woman, he means. <laughs> okay, first, it's bacteriology, not bacteriology. Second, having that line come out of a female character's mouth does not make it any less blatantly sexist. It turns out it's not just the ticket he's having trouble with, though, as one of the locals decides to pick the lock on his massive luggage. While the camera is away, it turns out the potential thief has mysteriously died. Huh, so he didn't get to see how it happened either. After Wells gets his ticket at a somewhat inflated price, Saxton decides to try a slightly different approach at negotiation. No, 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 you have to click and use the drop-down menu and select Persuade. The NPCs don't even notice when you jump on their food. But this is a classic adventure, so gameplay before graphics, and he gets his ticket. Shortly before, the tragedy involving his luggage is brought to the attention of Inspector Mirov, played by Giulio Pena. He also finds Alberto de Mendoza, who is Pujardov, a rather insane priest. The work of the devil. They said the same thing about rock and roll, heavy metal, and Pokemon. I think we can all agree at this point that the devil is not... <laughs> Lee explains to the officer exactly what is in the crate. Fossils. What is a fossil? A stone. And lies to him. While fossils are stones, technically they are a little more significant than that. And also the creature is frozen and quite obviously not fossilized. The eyes are still intact. Bujardov tries to show the people that Satan lies within the crate, as while he can draw on the sidewalk just fine, his chalk is considerably less effective on burlap. Proving that... eh... Uh, something. Rubbish. A conjurer's trick. Oh, successfully annoying Christopher Lee. They load the crate without further incident. Guys, uh, we're 12 minutes in, and this is a 90-minute film. Most movies from the 70s didn't go nearly this fast. Realizing this, the creature remains frozen for the rest of the scene, even keeping Peter from knowing just what's in the big box of mystery. Of course, a lady with an incredibly annoying poodle happens to walk in, distracting Christopher long enough for Pete to make a request. 
If um, someone were to drill a little hole in this crate during the night and uh, take a look at what's inside, I'd be very grateful. Jeez, you gave three bills just to be on the train. You're bribing the baggage man to risk his job and potentially his life breaking into this high-profile crate for a quarter? Who the fuck would do that? He continues at it, and it's more than a little obvious his whistling is out of sync with the video. Of course, it's not just this scene where that's the case. Most of the movie had to be redubbed in post-production. I have to commend the film, actually. All things considered, they did a pretty damn good job with that. Opening up, he spies the contents, then leaves it for no apparent reason. This opening allows the beast to reach out and, uh, form a crude lockpick? Right. The baggage man goes to stop it, but gets stared at with Terminator eyes, blinding him as well as taking his life. So, so this thing kills people and takes their abilities. Okay, uh, why didn't it just ask to be let out then? That sounds a little easier than whistling without lips. The priest, it turns out, is the personal priest of Countess Irina and Count Marian Petrovsky, played by Sylvia Tortosa and George Rigard, respectively. They apparently simply enjoy having a mad monk in their employ as an easy and fashionable manner to keep a hold of their get-out-of-hell-free card. You are jesting with her immortal soul. That's why we keep you, Pujardov. Our immortal souls are your concern. Okay, uh, hold on. I was led to believe that this movie was about a frozen hominid that came back to life on a train, and so far we've seen a heavy emphasis on spirituality, specifically Judeo-Christianity, and a creature that steals the abilities of those it kills, so... a little clarity, please. The lipless whistler is heard whistling very creepily the same tune that Irina was playing just now, which she hears but doesn't feel at all concerned about, probably because nobody else on the train appears to have heard anything. At this moment, the officer is a little more concerned about the safety of the baggage man, whose disappearance hasn't gone unnoticed. Don't ask me how. He's a fucking baggage man. It's not exactly the most high-profile position. Somehow the police think that it has something to do with the scientists and their suspicious box, which someone evidently tried to pry open. It, it may be my fault. I asked the baggage man to take a look. I was curious. Um, Peter, uh, there are these things called secrets. It's okay to have them once in a while. Builds tension. Makes things interesting. Chris goes on to say that the contents of the box have nothing to do with their problem and goes to leave. However, the officer's curiosity vetoes any concept of reasonable doubt, and he demands the key be handed over so they can open his personal belongings. Oh, nice going, Christopher. Now he's gonna find you for littering. This doesn't slow him down, as one of his subordinates happens to have a ridiculously powerful axe, which easily breaks through his steel chains in mere seconds, revealing for all to see. Right, so the monster killed the baggage man, picked his own lock, got out, put the man back in the box, and closed it up, and locked it tight before he left. Are you telling me that at eight that lived two million years ago, got out of that crate, Killed the baggage man and put him in there. Then locked everything up neat and tidy and got away. Oh, they acknowledge the ridiculousness of the situation. Yes, I am! Or not. Thus, Christopher Lee is locked up somewhere, and the officer wants to track down and destroy the creature by keeping the situation as low-key as possible. This means the completely normal, not-at-all-suspicious armed guards patrolling the passenger cars completely alone, so not exactly a problem for Cave Ape Terminator Monster Man. So by killing the guard, he gained the ability to neglect hiding corpses and leave an obvious trail. I know he's an incompetent guard, but damn. Overall training is likely pretty lax, though, as the officer has a secret conversation with Peter about the killing directly in front of the others in the crowded dining car. Now there's one more dead. One of my soldiers. The same white eyes. I want to know the cause of death. Who's dead? Keep your nose out of it. You didn't hear anything. Everyone who's 
thinking they've heard me speak about a man that's been killed. Shut up. You're hearing things. I didn't even speak. Got that? He gets Cushion to come out and perform an emergency autopsy, along with the help of Miss Jones, and we find out that by locked up, the policeman meant held in his cabin with a single inept armed guard. No worries, though, they still let the Countess through for some less than pleasant dinner conversation. If the theory of evolution is confirmed, if the science of biology is revolutionized, if the very origin of man is determined... Oh, don't worry. They'll dig up the Australopithecus skeleton Lucy two years after this movie is made. That and the mountains upon mountains of evidence supporting evolution... Yeah, it's definitely confirmed. I've heard of evolution. It's... it's immoral. Sadly, very little has changed in the 41 years after this movie was made. It's a fact. And there's no morality in a fact. Yeah, but then they can't guilt trip and scare people into thinking that they'll be tortured forever for acknowledging verifiable truth, and where's the fun in that? Back with the autopsy, they start by popping the top off his cranium. Luckily for them, that provides an odd clue to their mystery. Learning and memory are engraved on the normal brain, leaving a wrinkled surface. But what? Neurology wasn't this bass backwards even then! The famous patient H.M. had his hippocampus removed in 1953 and was heavily studied from 1957 onward by neurological scientists after they realized that that's where memory is stored in the brain. The wrinkles have nothing to do with that! After they leave, the monster comes in and double-checks his work for no apparent reason. Of course, who would happen to walk in but a spy, out to crack a safe and steal a certain item? Seconds after she gets a hold of it, the man-bear ape gets a hold of her, proving that he is the reigning world champion at staring contests. Though she is still pretty good herself, I mean, I'd have blinked long before crying blood and going blind. Wait a minute. Why the fuck doesn't anyone just close their eyes? Peter happens by just in time to be attacked as well. However, he is saved by the policeman, who ends up in a strange gazing standoff against the creature before shooting it dead. At the 41 minute mark. The fuck? What the hell are they gonna do for the next hour? Get stuck in customs? Don't know, but Inspector Mirov collapses and later comes to while alone. I guess Morningwood is slightly more embarrassing after having killed something. Christopher Lee stops by as evidently that imprisonment to his personal cabin was just a timeout. He explains that the spy girl also had her brain formatted, and he believes that the creature that was killed has been absorbing people's knowledge through the eyes, because that makes sense. And yet, what? A creature like that? How would it ever die? I don't have to say it, do I? It's obvious, right? In case you didn't figure it out, they pretty much just lay it out for all to see. It belonged to Count Petrovsky. How do you know? I saw him put it in the safe. So there you have it. The creature's mind jumped into him. And despite how obvious this is, nobody else manages to figure it out. The material is a new type of steel with incredible strength. It turns out that locking it away was also kind of pointless, as Count Petrovsky is the only one who knows how to make it. Anyhow, their experimentation continues as they extract the eye fluid. And although I'm usually not squeamish about needles in my reviews, I'll spare you the repeating clips of the needle jabbing into the creature's eye. In the fluid, they see something strange. It's a brontosaurus! A pterodactyl! What is there to say? The Countess walks in just as they're finding... I goo memories of the Earth, seen from space. <laughs> right, so it's perfectly logical that their two million year old ape man was able to see the dinosaurs because, hey, he's actually an alien. What. The. Fuck. No, don't let me stop you. Please, let every character, no matter how minor or insane, line up to take a look, including Bajardov. This results in him babbling on about it being the memory from the Eye of Satan from back when the devil was chillin' with God, checking out the creation of the Earth. And a second long shadow is more than enough time for the man to steal the specimen for some reason. I look in the baggage car. Right. Right, uh, alone? Dark room? Nobody around to help. Uh, you know, uh, for a film from the 70s, this already has a uh, plenty high body count. 
Unsurprisingly, she runs into Mirav and spills the beans about the discovery. Who else has seen such pictures? Dr. Wells, Professor Saxon, and that pretty countess. But what they didn't realize is that the alien demon ape Satan knows the evil art of the non-disclosure agreement. Well, if you were going to do that, why'd you even bother asking? It turns out that the monkey's there as well, and he gives it back its eye. I uh, don't think that's exactly how an eye for an eye is supposed to work. He suddenly vanishes when everyone else comes in to find Mirov with a dead woman, and again fail to put two and two together, but he comes back again later for a message. I will serve you. The fuck? Uh, you do remember you just spent the last 50 minutes of the movie going on and on and on about defeating the unholy, and now you're just gonna go and join Team Satan? What's wrong with you? He doesn't care for the offer and moves on, but later Lee discovers the conductor has been killed and sends a message to an upcoming station. This raises the attention of Captain Kazan, played by Telly Savalas. But don't expect the who loves you baby in this movie. This was before he starred in Kojak. Nevertheless, he's still a very entertaining actor in this movie. Despite playing kind of a jerk, he's got a great charisma. Oh good, send a telegram. Tell him that Captain Kazan... He knows that a horse has four legs. He knows that a murderer has two arms. But still, the devil must be afraid of one honest Cossack. Hmm? No, no, Telly, it's not the devil anymore. We've moved on to uh, aliens. Learning that the engineer knows a thing or two about the potential to reach escape velocity, the alien sucks his brain out, and then, after a tip from the nut job, comes into the Count's cabin to ask about the metal. This steel at high temperatures, what happens to it? It gets stronger. Ah, uh, uh, pardon me, but, uh, shouldn't he already know this? Uh, he sucked out the spy's brain, and I'm... Pretty sure that she knew a thing or two about the metal she was hired to steal. His brain job will have to wait, though, as Telly Savalas stops the train to yell at everybody, belligerently upstaging the entire cast in but one scene. You English believe in free speech, don't you, huh? Certainly. If instead of babbling nonsense you'd investigate this property... Oh! This is outrageous! Oh. I don't believe this. It's criminal! To think that they wasted an hour in this movie before even having Savala show up! The demon priest believes he can defend alien Satan with the power of the cross. Somehow. He has the evil eye. <laughs> Man, I gotta get past this scene. I can't just have five minutes of me going all fangirl for Savalas. After Telly figures out in minutes the obvious that Inspector Mirov is extremely suspicious, Chris cuts the lights, revealing that he was the alien demon or whatever the fuck for all to see. As a result, he is stabbed, shot, and shot some more. But of course, Bajardov slips through to meet up with him before he dies, allowing the alien being to take his body as a host. This leads to a scene of absolute slaughter, as alien Bujardov goes through the men one by one, killing them all. And still, not a single one of them has thought to try something like, <laughs> maybe closing their eyes. Also, despite being a super mega hyper genius at this point, he still takes the opportunity to suck the mind out of the Count, revealing to him the formula to make the super steel. Now all he has to do is figure out how to run a manufacturing process and build a rocket ship all by himself. But Christopher Lee is here to save the day. You mean him behind me? Uh, that's not behind him. The alien reveals that he is in fact an alien, and many of them came to Earth millions of years ago, but he was accidentally left behind. Because while they might have mastered intergalactic travel, strangely, their species had never invented the roll call. Thus, he survived by hopping from creature to creature, like an evolutionary game of musical chairs. What am I to do with you? Let me go. That's not possible. It is possible. I will teach you to end disease, pain, hunger. Hmm, good deal. All he wants to do is leave, and he's a mega genius. This is the obvious choice. Wait a minute. It means they do the exact opposite, doesn't it? Of course, he still plans to shoot him, so in retaliation, the alien thingamajig reveals another ability, raising an army of zombies out of all the victims in this movie. 
Don't ask me, because I have no fucking idea how the hell that's supposed to work. Had they stuck with the demonic fossil, it might, but they just had to introduce the world to space alien eye memory zombies. Anyway, Chris and the Countess escaped through the back of the train, just in the nick of time as they detached the baggage car, coincidentally, after someone sent a telegram to the station to switch the train to a railway, guaranteeing the death of everyone aboard, which, of course, they follow without question, leading to our alien antagonist exploding in the wreckage. Along with all the evidence of what the fuck even happened, but I'm sure the police will understand when all of the patients explain that it was the Satan fossil that summoned this demon from space that jumped bodies and brought zombies forth. It was the 70s. Well, that was Horror Express, and just... Wow. I have to say, it did surprise me several times, but the first time was because I wasn't expecting it to be a spiritually based plot, and again after it turned out it didn't, but suddenly switched gears to science fiction. It's widely regarded as a cult classic, and that is reflected in the very high rating it holds on IMDb, but this is one instance where I'm going to have to disagree pretty sharply with the median. It's an entertaining enough movie for its time, and had more than enough enjoyable moments, but when held up to scrutiny, a lot of points just fell apart for me. Firstly, it's a very odd monster at the heart of this movie. The thought-out beast was standard fare, the stare of death was unique and not too strange, the added skill points for experience gained was odd for a movie, but believable enough, but once it started swapping bodies, things fell apart very quickly. First thing being that for some reason, Mirov gets a beast arm after the swap. Why? It's never explained. None of its other victims suffer this either, so why just him becomes another question, and again, one that goes unanswered. Also, the killing as the near-dead Iceman is entirely superfluous and you realize he could have just swapped bodies with the thief from the start and walked into the world to do whatever the fuck. Beyond that, the monk going from devout to demonic was just ludicrous, and minor plot issues seem a bit shoehorned in, like the spy who showed up and less than five appearances later is dead, and Telly also merely interrupting the film briefly with his presence. Still, the acting is solid all around, and the presentation not bad, but the unbalanced plotline and fucking insane focal point diminish the quality of the film greatly, coming into the station at two Telly Savalas out of five. Entertaining enough for fans of the genre, but if your family has more varied tastes, you might want to put on a different movie this Thanksgiving. Like Chopping Mall! Still love that one. Thank you all for watching, I have been Decker Shadow, and remember, if an alien being is trying to take over your body through the optic nerve... Fucking blink! Jones, I shall need your assistance. Yes, well, at your age, I'm not surprised. With an autopsy. Oh, well, that's different. 